I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are continuing with our study of the book of Revelation. Uh, today we'll be dealing with Revelation 20. We thank God for the journey from Revelation chapter 1. We are now in the book of Revelation chapter 20. The preview, remember, last in Revelation chapter 19, we dealt with the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in breaking it down, we had Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, mentioning the marriage supper of the Lamb. And verses 11 to 21, another supper, the great supper of God. So if you did not accept the invitation to be in the marriage supper of the Lamb, there is another supper that you will be going to that one uninvited and going there unwillingly. Or at, let me say by choice, because the invitation, the king gave the wedding garment, and all those who refused, they had to partake in the great supper of God. So we found the two suppers. You remember also we mentioned the Jewish wedding uh, where a, a bridegroom will go and to the father of the bride and pay a dowry. And after paying the dowry, would come back home, prepare a place for his wife uh, to be. And after he had paid the dowry, the, the issue was now settled that she now belongs to him. He prepares the place in his father's house, come back, fetch his bride, and take him home. So we explain with that that same with Jesus. Jesus came at, at the cross of Calvary. He paid the dowry. After paying the dowry, he went back to his father's house in John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. In my father's house are many mentioned. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare the place. And if I go, I'll come back. That where I am, there you may be also. So we are in the process now where the, the bride is preparing herself for the bridegroom to come and fetch her as soon as she's ready. Uh, today we will be going through Revelation chapter 20. And remember we said the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 11. The Berians were of a noble character than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word wholeheartedly and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So it's important that we go through the scriptures and search the scriptures. Before we dwell deeper into the book of Revelation 20, let us have the word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord God Almighty, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for protection. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, that we may go deeper in your word, that we may be cleansed through your word. For thy word, O Lord, it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless us, Lord, as we go through your word. In Jesus we pray. Amen. The book of Revelation, chapter 20, let's begin with verses 1 to 4. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. We'll be looking also at the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 1, I'm reading new hearing. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and the Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Let us look at the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. An angel came, bound Satan, and thrown, thrown him, and put a seal unto him that he should be bound for a thousand years. Question, why is he bound for a thousand years? The chain 
that is spoken of here? Is it a literal chain? Is it everything mentioned here literally or symbolic? Let us look also at the book of Leviticus chapter 16. Let's look at verses 21 and 20. And the Bible says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Do you see the parallel? In Revelation, it's an angel. In Leviticus, it's a man, a powerful man, taking a goat. This goat, number one, the priest will lay his both hands on the head of this goat, transferring the sins of the children of Israel upon the head of this goat. And, in, and after transferring these sins, let's hear what verse 22 says. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Please don't miss the parallels between the two. In Leviticus, uh, first the priest lay both his hands upon the head of this goat. Background, you remember they had to take two goats. One goat will be the goat of the Lord, and the other one will be the goat Azazel. The goat of the Lord was to be killed, and its blood was to be used for the atonement of the children of Israel. This goat then represents Jesus Christ, who was, to die, who was to come and die and share his blood. And through his blood, the sins of all humanity will be cleansed who believe in him. So the other live goat was to be taken, which is called a scapegoat or Azazel. And this goat represents Satan. It is taken by a mighty man. And take note where he's taking this goat to. He's taking it to a place uninhibited, a place where there are no people staying, a place that is a wilderness. And it is to be left there for it to live there without no one. So this goat, Azazel, or scapegoat, it represents Satan. As you will see in the book of Revelation, that the devil, when he is bound by the chain of circumstances, he is let to be alone in this planet Earth when it is in its form as a desert. For he has no one to deceive. Why no one? The saints, remember, when Jesus comes, are taken to heaven. The wicked, they are destroyed. So the devil has no one to deceive. So if he's got no one to deceive, therefore he feels chained. He feels arrested. For remember, for the last 6,000 years, the duty of the devil is to deceive. So now if there's no one to deceive, he feels he is in chain. He is bound for a thousand years. Let's continue. And verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Our presentation today is titled, A Thousand Years. So in these thousand years, several things are happening. Question number one, when does it begin? Question number two, when does it end? And what's happening during the period of a thousand years? The, the verse we've just read, it talks about the saints of the Most High, who are to be the saint, the priest, and the kings of Christ, and will reign with him a thousand years. So when does the thousand years begin? When Christ shall come, that will mark the beginning of a thousand years, because the dead in Christ will be raised. After being raised, then they are taken to heaven, 
and as they are in heaven, the verse said, they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Let's continue up to verse 7. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This presentation, if you like, you can title it the first and the second resurrection. And it says, this is the first resurrection. And why first resurrection? It's because these people in the first resurrection are all the people who accepted Jesus as their Lord and the personal savior. Allow me to go to Psalms 116 verse 15. Let's pick up something there. Psalms 116, let's read verse 15. Verse 15 reads as follow, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. How can death be precious? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It looks like it's, it contradicts the chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians rather, chapter 15, verse 26. Paul says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And here it says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. How can death be precious? And before you conclude in saying that the two texts, they contrast each other, or this one is against the other one, wait a minute. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So you put death, you put God, then there is enmity. So God and death, they don't work together. But God says, precious in his sight is the death of his saints. Why precious is in his sight is the death of his saints? Let's look at the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, let's start from verses 16, 17, and 18. Uh, verse 16 say, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Wow. Remember now, let's link Psalms 116 verse 15 with this uh, Thessalonians 4.16. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why so? Because they have part in the first resurrection. In, in this chapter it says, uh, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. So meaning, if you die in Christ, so you become precious unto the Lord, for you died for him. Therefore, as you live, living for him, dying for him, when he comes, he raises you first. And when he raises you, it marks the beginning of a thousand years. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wait a minute. What is Paul saying here? We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who is them? Remember, when Christ shall come the first time, number one, we said it marks the beginning of a thousand years. Number two, the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. Don't forget the book of Revelation 20. It said the rest of the dead live not till a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So first resurrection are the dead in Christ. The rest of the dead did not live until a thousand years was finished. So there's a gap between the dead in Christ and the rest. When I say the rest, I mean the rest who did not accept Jesus Christ and they died far from the Lord. So when Jesus comes, the, 
the thing that happens first is the first resurrection. Those who died in him are raised first. And as they come out of their grave, Paul says, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord always. So you have two groups now. Number one, the dead Christians. They are resurrected. That is first resurrection. Number two, the living Christians. They are translated. And together with the dead Christians, they meet the Lord in the air. So shall they be with the Lord for a thousand years in heaven. And the question, what happened to the wicked who did not accept Christ and were still alive when Jesus came? Let us look at the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you pick up something? Those who do not obey God, when Jesus shall come, they are destroyed by the glory of his presence. So you have three groups now. Group number one, the dead in Christ are raised first. Group number two, Christians who are alive when he shall come, they are translated together with the dead, the dead in Christ. They meet the Lord in the air. So shall they be with the Lord. Number three, the living wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his glory, as per 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. What happens to the wicked dead? Remember in Revelation chapter 20, where we are going back to now, it said, the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. And let's go to verse Five, but the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6 of Revelation 20, it says, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. In that thousand years, remember, the saints are in heaven. The wicked are dead. No one to bury them. They are scattered all over. The devil, as it was with the goat, Azazel, that was taken into the wilderness. We will also go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4, verse 23 to 25. You will see that this earth, when Jesus shall come, with the plagues that are to take place, remember also that the sun the moon and everything was sort of like moved to its from its own position and the sky was rolled like a scroll therefore this the state of this planet earth will be like in its infancy just when god began creating the the earth was formless and void so shall it be the devil will remain in that dark place in that world where it is not inhibited by human beings. And he will feel being chained. But take note, it is only for a while. Because it says after a thousand years, then he will be loosed. How is he getting loosed up when he is bound? We are now in verse 8. All right, let's go to verse 7 again. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Remember, he felt being in prison because he had no one to deceive. But after a thousand years, remember the text above. It says the rest of the dead lived not until a thousand years. What happened after a thousand years? It's what we called the second resurrection. Because the dead who did not die in Christ are resurrected after a thousand years. And when they are resurrected, now the devil feels now he's being loosed. Why is he being loosed? It's because his duty 
is to deceive. Let's see if indeed, when we continue with Revelation 20, that after the resurrection of the wicked, will we find Satan deceiving them? And verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. It's shocking. The number of them is as the sand of the sea. It means many people will be following the devil. As Christ once mentioned, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and few be they that find it. So it is not easy for people, it is not easy for us to live a righteous life, to be Christians, and constrain ourselves, and live doing all these other things, symbolized by Christ in saying, white is the way, and many be they that, find, that are in it, and few be they that find a way that leads to life, and many they are on the way that leads to destruction. So, in Revelation 20, it says, as many as the sand of the sea are now resurrected. After being resurrected, after a thousand years, the devil begins his job. So he feels now he is out of prison. Why? Because he's got multitude to deceive. Why is he deceiving them? He wants them to wage war with the city, the city of God. And let's continue verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of them and it devoured them. So picture with me, here comes New Jerusalem. And the Bible says, we'll be landing in a place called the Mount of Olives. As it lands after a thousand years, the saints are inside. Beautiful is the city. Don't miss our next presentation in Revelation chapter 21, for we'll be getting into details, into the walls of the city, the transparent glasses of the city, the foundation of the city, the doors, three gates in each side of this four square city. But for today, picture it coming down. As it comes down, inside are the saints, outside are the wicked, and they, their number is as the sand of the sea. And the devil says, let us go and attack the city. And my Bible says, fire came down from God and it devoured them. So that is hell. Hell does not exist currently, but hell will be existing after a thousand years where people will be burned. And in them being burned, they will not burn forever. They will be consumed until they are finished. The word used, burning forever, it, it's like a paper. When you say a paper will burn forever, what do you mean? You mean the paper will not be extinguished, but the paper will burn until its consummation. So the forever type used in the text saying they will burn forever, it does not mean they will burn perpetually. Imagine a man who's not even 6,000 years burning forever. Imagine a, a, a boy who's 6,000 16 years old, who committed his sin for 16 years, and he bends forever. What kind of God will that be? We, we will not be that a cruel God. God would want all of us to be saved. Hence, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, God is not willing that any should perish, but that we should all come to repentance and to the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, as many people are going for the devil are going to hell, and God would want them to go not to hell, but to heaven. So Jesus Christ came and paid the dowry so that you and me can take part in the first resurrection. If it happens that the Lord, when he comes, we will be dead. If we will still be alive, we will be translated. As Paul said, that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them and meet the Lord in the air. So shall we be with the Lord. How so? Number one, when you die, you don't go to heaven. Number two, 
if Jesus comes and the dead are ra raised from their grave, that simply means they did not die and go to heaven. For he would have not said in the text we mentioned in our last presentation, John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. In my father's house are many mentioned. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare the place. And if I go, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus Christ is coming so that we may be where he is. Where he is now, we cannot reach without him. We are waiting for his second coming. And remember, in our last presentation, we presented the the false or the counterfeit trinity. That is the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We picked up in our last presentation, Revelation 19, that the beast and the false prophet were thrown into the fire. They were thrown alive into the fire. And what, who remained? It was the devil. And I said to you, we will be talking about him today. As you saw, he was bound for a thousand years. After a thousand years, he was released. After he's been released, he is now facing his music. He is thrown also into the lake of fire. Let's see that in verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The forever and ever, it means until they become ashes. It does not mean that we'll be celebrating in heaven and the devil is burning. The people are burning forever and ever. It is not so. They will burn until they are consumed. That is why the book of Malachi chapter Chapter 4, verse 1. Let's go there quickly so that you don't say, I say. You say the Bible says. Because it says it will be, they will be burned up until it leaves no root or branch. Malachi chapter 4. Let's look at verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. What does that mean? If it leaves them neither root nor branch, it means root the devil himself, branch his followers. It will leave neither of them, but they will become ashes under the souls of our feet, meaning in the new heavens and the new earth, we will not have problem of being deceived. We will not have problems of temptation. We will not have problems of the devil troubling God's people all over the world. As we go, come now to the conclusion of the book of Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. There is a book of life. There are other books. Make sure that your name is registered in the book of life, so that when Jesus shall come, you know that you are safe. For the rest of the people whose name are not appearing there, they will end up in hellfire. Remember, if you were not accepting the invitation of the marriage supper, you were accept, automatically accepting to go to the great supper of God. Verse 12, verse 13 rather, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the choice is yours. Choose God and be registered, registered, in the book of life, so that when he shall come, you take part in the first resurrection. When he shall come, you will be a priest and a king of Christ, reigning with him for a thousand years. 
Till that time, let us keep on holding on. Don't miss our next presentation titled, No More See, No More Tears. May the good Lord be with us all. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to have a firm faith that will remain unshaken in troublous time. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.